Hello and welcome to Media Law. This is the first module of the course and this mini lecture is module 1A where we'll be introducing the material. We'll be looking at media law in the Web 2 era and we'll also be looking a little bit about how journalists and the media interact with the court system. So first an introduction. Uh, my name is Mark Pearson. I'm Professor of Journalism and Social Media at Griffith University and my background is as a journalist, as a journalism educator and my qualifications include both law, journalism and uh, the broader humanities and education. So welcome. It's going to be quite a journey uh, for many of you. You, uh, you have no, never studied any media law before but each of you comes with a different background. Some of you are doing this course because you are journalism or public relations students and it's obviously a required part of the course for journalists and public relations practitioners to understand the law and how it affects their occupation. Some of you are law students uh, who are embarking in a career on the law and may be doing this as an elective because at some stage you may need to advise on some of the key areas of media law. And anyway, it's wonderful to see the other areas of the law you've learned put into practice in a professional context like journalism and public relations. And some of you may just be doing it as an elective for other purposes. And if that's the case, you'll learn a little bit more about the law, the way the media interacts with the law, and some broader philosophical uh, issues to do with freedom of speech, freedom of expression, and the extent to which that speech and expression should be regulated. As part of the introduction, I might point out that these mini lectures are only a supplement to the other learning activities in the course. Uh, they are only relatively short. I will not be going into particular cases in a whole lot of detail in these mini lectures. It's more of a conversational way of introducing you to the topic area of each module uh, so that you can start to get your head around it before you go into the deeper learning which we'll look at uh, in a few moments. As far as media law goes and as far as the approach for journalists, public relations practitioners, other communication professionals and lawyers, your approaches to the course might be slightly different but each of you brings something special to your study of media law. For example, journalism students might be a little intimidated that there are some law students studying the course. But you've got to remember that the journalism students actually know a great deal about the media and its operations, while the law students might know a little bit more about legal institutions and some of the key legal areas and how they operate. So each of you brings something special to your learning but each of you needs to learn from other students through the, the discussion board and other activities so that you can supplement your own strengths with the strength of knowledge and understanding of others. To that end, uh, for that deeper understanding, we, we've scaffolded the uh, learning activities in the course. There are readings and it's really essential that you do do the chapter readings from the textbook. I'm fortunate to have a, a co-author of the textbook, uh, Mark Polden, who has worked with me uh, through the past couple of editions of the textbook. He's a former barrister uh, with the Fairfax Group and uh, he is an expert, uh, has worked for more than a couple of decades advising journalists in media law. So you get both that legal and the journalism perspectives. So there are the chapter readings, there are the full lectures, that are recorded and available to you via uh, lecture capture. There are the learning problems and it's vital that you read and understand the learning problem for each module early on and then come back to it in detail as you get the knowledge because the idea of problem-based learning is that that problem should be driving a lot of your learning and understanding of the topic areas as we deal with them. There are little quizzes uh, at the end of each module and a final one at the end of the semester which tests your actual memory of the topics covered in the textbook. And of course the assessment items uh, including the essay that will be explained to you later 
and the final take-home exam, which is a final exercise uh, based around a learning problem where you have a limited time to do it, but you um, learn to apply many of the topic areas we've learned in the course to an actual finale situation. My first piece of advice in this introduction is to study the course profile and uh, the course site very, very carefully. Get very familiar with that because it has all of the key dates, the lengths, the, uh, the um, uh, detailed description of the assessment items in there for you. You'll see that there is a study plan uh, that I have developed and it sits there on the slide. You'll see that um, as a recommended approach to uh, immersing yourself in the course, viewing this mini lecture, previewing the learning problem, uh, getting to grips with the relevant chapter and study guide materials for, for the section, answering, discussing as many of those uh, end of chapter questions as you can, completing the formative quiz uh, for the module, returning to the learning problem so that you've got on board a lot of this knowledge to apply to the learning problem, engaging in discu discussion with your peers on the discussion board about the learning problem and other questions you might have, and finding and reflecting upon the recent readings and tweeting your uh, examples of recent cases and news articles about the, the particular topic of media law to our hashtag ML Griff uh, hashtag on, uh, on Twitter. Chapter one of the textbook deals with media law in the, uh, in the Web 2 era. And I think you'll find it a very useful introductory chapter to give a, a real context to why we're looking at media law and, and why it's so, so special. It starts by looking at the digital dimensions of media law and how the Web 2 era, and particularly social media, have really made media law something that millions of citizens really have to understand. Because every time we send a tweet or post a, a message to Facebook or, or an image to Instagram, or even post our own blog if you're a blogger, every time we engage in this modern form of communication to other people, we are deemed in the eyes of the law to be publishers. We are now publishers. And for many generations, it was really only journalists and newspaper publishers or, or television or radio executives who had to know much about media law because they were the only ones reaching any real audience through their outputs. But today, we have so many people operating in almost complete ignorance of media law, but they're taking enormous risks with their outputs. And no matter which of those areas you're entering into, you'll be called upon to engage in public communication at various stages of your career. So this is a course that may well uh, save you a lot of money in, in damages um, and, and also perhaps even for some people keep you out of jail. Much is spoken about in the various topic areas of media law about this term, the public interest. And it's often accompanying, accompanying that uh, very important right that we have internationally called freedom of expression or free speech, or in a narrower sense, the free press or a free media. And the argument goes that um, media or people who are engaging in public communication, um, if they're doing that in the public interest, then they have a right to do so and uh, should have defences available uh, to people who wish to tear them down or to uh, prosecute them under various laws. The problem with that term, the public interest, as the textbook explains, is that it's used often very, very loosely by journalists because they believe everything that they're doing is in the public interest or interesting to the public. But it's used very narrowly by judges and legislators because they will read the term the public interest to be only matters of legitimate and grave public concern to society. 
And I think it's important to implant that seed early on in your understanding. Is something you're dealing with or is some behaviour of you as a public communicator legitimately in the public interest? And if so, is there some defence that supports that and what defence might you have available? What are the ingredients or, or the elements of that defence that you might be able to argue to uh, go ahead with that publication? Australia has all sorts of idiosyncrasies uh, because although we're operating in the Web2 era and much of our publishing is international, we publish across borders and uh, therefore we do come under uh, the domain or the umbrella of the law wherever our material is downloaded. But because we're publishing and operating in Australia normally, then there are all sorts of Australian-based laws that apply to us that sometimes might be quite different in this jurisdiction of Australia or its various states and territories than it might be in other parts of the world. One of the most notable differences, of course, is between Australia and the United States of America. The US has uh, a, a, very, a very strong uh, principle, a, a right to free expression, enshrined in its First Amendment to the Constitution. And that underpins so many of the areas of media law in the US. But Australia does not have an equivalent to the First Amendment. And therefore, what you'll find quite often is people in the US publishing all sorts of things that Australian publishers are not able to publish because some area of the law, like defamation or contempt of court, might impact upon uh, them if they publish that way. So beware of those differences in Australia and even differences between states and territories in media law. Another important dis distinction in this, uh, in this introductory uh, mini lecture is to distinguish between law, ethics and regulation of these things. You see, there are many uh, similarities between law and ethics for someone like a journalist operating uh, in this space. But the simplest way to look at, it, look at it is the law is society's actual rules handed down through cases or, or legislation which you absolutely must abide by. They're the set boundaries of your behaviour. Yes, courts and uh, legislators will argue at the, at the margins, but laws are pretty much set in stone and uh, we learn much about those that, are, uh, that, that have particular criteria attached to them in this course. That's a little bit different from ethics. Ethics is really uh, your own code of behaviour, even down to your own moral principles. But in this context, we're normally talking about professional ethics and most occupations, including journalism, the law, public relations, most of them do have a code of ethics or ethical principles that their occupation or profession needs to abide by. And uh, that's, uh, that's also a set down uh, a code. Uh, the journalist's code of ethics is a great example, but it's not enforceable by law. And that's a difference. There can be some regulators involved there, um, sometimes self-regulators. The journalist's code of ethics is regulated by the journalist's professional association called the Media, Entertainment and Arts Alliance. The Public Relations Ethical Code is regulated by the Public Relations Institute of Australia's uh, body uh, of disciplinary action. And lawyers have their own uh, registration uh, boards and councils which regulate their ethics. Um, it's really, in, in some areas of the law, there are similarities. Uh, for example, as a student or, or as a journalist, you shouldn't plagiarise. And that is um, basically take someone else's words and, and portray them as your own. And you certainly shouldn't do that in this course. But in the legal sense, uh, that would be a breach of copyright, uh, a copyright that someone else holds. And that would be a legally enforceable right of somebody to, uh, to uh, take action of um, uh, a breach of their, uh, an infringement of their copyright. Now, there are various bodies that operate to regulate media behaviour. And uh, a self-regulatory body I mentioned is the MEAA, the Media Entertainment and Arts Alliance, as is the PRIA that I mentioned earlier. 
Um, there's also the Australian Press Council, which is a regulatory, a self-regulatory body um, you know, with newspapers and online newspapers in, within their domain. We also have co-regulatory bodies where the media organisations cooperate with government entities uh, for a system of co-regulation. And a great example of that is the Australian uh, Communications and Media Authority, where there are various codes of practice uh, followed by the broadcasting groups, but the ACMA has ultimate authority and there can be very heavy uh, fines and um, licence conditions placed upon uh, those TV or radio stations for their misbehaviour. And we also have regulatory bodies, bodies that are there uh, that are within the bounds of media law. And some of you might have heard of some of them, the uh, Australian um, Competition and Consumer Commission, which is the ACCC. And that uh, really polices consumer behaviour and sometimes media groups fall foul of that body and again face uh, large penalties and, um, and various um, conditions placed, placed upon their behaviour. Uh, that was mainly what we covered in Chapter 1. Uh, chapter 3 introduces students to the legal and regulatory systems and, and practices. I've mentioned a little bit about the self-regulators and, and, and the regulators, and law students will particularly be across the Australian legal system, its various uh, levels of operation, the court system, uh, the superior and inferior courts, the, the levels of, um, of those court systems, and the respective weights of their judgments in, in important legal cases. Students who've come from other disciplines, such as uh, journalism or, or public relations, really need to get on top of these uh, court systems and the way law is made. Uh, you need to be on top of this because not only is it very important to this course that you understand what a case is, what a precedent is, why a high court decision is more important than a district or a county court decision. You need to understand all of that for this course, but you also need it in your profession and in your life. Australia, sadly, does not have a, a high level of uh, education in this area of what the Americans call civics education, understanding our, our legal system and the way it operates. Australian students have a lot of catching up to do in that area. And if you're going to be a journalist, you need to report upon these courts. If you're a public relations practitioner, you sometimes need to deal with these courts and these sorts of decisions, or you may be involved with Parliament and the legislative process, um, how statutes are developed, the committees of Parliament and how, um, how they work through the parliamentary system uh, to enact laws, and then in turn how the courts might interpret those laws or, uh, or some of the wording within those laws to come up with important legal precedents. All of that's centred around the Australian Constitution, and uh, which sets out uh, what powers the various courts and legislators have, and puts in place a system of appeal or review, uh, so that people who are um, uh, you know, disappointed with a particular decision know their avenues for appeal and uh, rectification of that problem. So, to understand the materials, um, have a very good read of, of Chapter 3. If you are a journalism or a PR or a, a non-law student, please work through all of the end of, chap end of chapter uh, questions and topics for debate. Jump onto that discussion board so you are well across the legal system and its way of operation before we delve into the actual topic areas and start to look at some cases and some legislation. So, please don't find all of that intimidating. If you follow the study plan as we've outlined it, I think you'll find it is a very enjoyable journey of learning. And if you do follow that study plan closely, I think you'll deepen or embed that learning much further than a student might who simply swats up on the chapters uh, for you know, the, the final exercise or a final exam. 
So welcome to Media Law. I really hope you enjoy the course and I do hope that perhaps in some small way it saves you from some large damages payout or perhaps it might even save you from going to jail. Welcome.